Thank you. Thank you. Is my microphone okay? Yeah? Cool. So I'm Des from Intercom, and uh, this is going to be a very fast presentation, uh, not in terms of its duration, in terms of the speed I have to present at. Yeah, I'll be speaking in an accent probably unfamiliar to a few of you. It's from Ireland. Uh, if you can't understand me, just wave my hand, and I'll, I don't know, I'll do my best to do an American accent. Uh, <laughs> so, like, what a crazy time to be building products. <laughs> um, so, right, uh, it's funny. This is like the world before, say, social media and all the social media products arrived. You had a desk that had all of these, uh, what we would now call, like, uh, I guess, unbundled single point solution devices on your desk, uh, such as a telephone or a file of acts or, you know, if you wanted to be entertained, you would just look out the window. You could not go and watch Gangnam Style on YouTube five times. So uh, what's interesting is all of, these, all of these real world things are just being displaced by what are now software things. And another way to think about this is something like this. This is what the world looked like when I was a teenager. If I was listening to music, for example, I was actually listening to music. Or if I was talking to friends, I was genuinely hanging out with my friends. And if I was playing music, I was playing music. This is what the world looks like today. And this is interesting, because this is actually what we're doing. We're creating all this stuff, right? This is actually more realistically what the world looks like today. You know, all these people are all doing fundamentally different tasks in the exact same physical orientation, in the exact same sort of device. Like, that one person could be reading the hashtag warm gun. That dude's probably shopping. Hopefully, he's buying himself a better hat. Uh, someone else is sharing photos. The last dude actually should probably buy himself a better hat, too. But uh, the point being that, like, software is effectively eating the world. And that's Mark Andreessen's quote from quite a while ago, which is, and his key point is, like, every single business or service or product or physical piece is slowly being replaced by a internet product. It doesn't have to be a web app, it can be a mobile app, whatever, that's killing it. And it's, you know, hands up in this room who works on products, just out of curiosity. Cool, so I am at the right conference, good. Uh, uh, and it's people like us that get to pick what's actually on the menu here. So if software is eating everything, who gets to actually choose what's on the menu? It's interesting to think about this because software is going to become like, you know, well, if it isn't already, it will become like the de facto thing that most things we do exist within. Um, and for younger people today who can't remember a world free software, you end up with these interesting questions like, my niece who was like 20 turned around to me a while ago and said like, where do products come from? And I was like, well, what the hell do you mean by that? And I was like, she was like, well, I've got all this shit on my phone. Where does it all come from? And I was like, well, that's a really weird question. Because no one asks that about like Coldplay or like U2 or Nirvana. Like, you know, it's, the people behind it are pretty obvious, right? You know how that stuff got there. Um, but like, no, like the rest of the world has no idea what actually causes this, you know, uh, like six months of sweat and hard work and tears and funding and venture capital and all that sort of shit. And at the other end pops a little icon on your phone, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, but that is the reality of the world we're in. So I started looking into this, because it's actually not a straightforward answer, because you can say, oh, well, people build software. Yeah, duh. But like, what does that actually mean? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about managing a product, managing product scope, managing feature creep, improving a product, and lastly, delivering magic. So why do products get built? Well, there's been a bit of research into this, and it's an interesting question to me anyway. Uh, if you ask why was this created, typically it comes down to like one of five reasons. So you have someone who at the top who is eff effectively like a product uh, visionary. They have a vision of a cohesive piece of like functionality that exists. And th that's very, very clear to them. Another way you do it is you have a customer-focused person who fully understands the sort of pains of customers in the world, and they really want to look after the, uh, their customers. Those people are probably the only people on this list who can claim to be a customer-focused company. There's auteurs, which are people who blend this wonderful world of art with business happening as a byproduct. Um, there are people who are scratching their own itch. They literally, something keeps coming up in their business, that's a pain in the ass, so they basically build a tool to remove that pain. It just so happens other people need that too. Uh, and there are people who just follow patterns, which is like you observe a pattern in the, in the business world that's working, and you think, hey, I'm gonna get in on that. Um, and I see people rapidly taking slides. I'm gonna go through this real fast, but you will get the slides afterwards. Um, so let's pick on one of these. Uh, so let's say pattern recognition, and that's a particularly popular one in, in cities such as here. Uh, Jared was correct earlier when he said it's 
it does do the world of good to pop outside of San Francisco every now and then. Um, you don't have to go as far as Dublin, but uh, yeah, in Dublin we're still back a little bit uh, before. Things like uh, Square and stuff just don't exist for us, so it's a total magical mystery to her to get here. So let's talk about pattern recognition. So pattern recognition loosely, when you're building a product according to a pattern, it, it, you know, it's sort of what you see is, does everyone know what this icon is? It's Tinder, <coughs> so I've been told. <laughs> um, who, who, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Everyone's like, yeah, I knew that. Uh, uh, but there is now Tinder for professionals, right? There is Tinder for jobs. There is Tinder for creatives. There's Tinder for dresses. There's even Tinder for dogs, right? This is pattern uh, recognition. This is when you see something's working and you say, well, I want to adapt that to a particular problem, problem domain. And pattern recognition is a whole type of way products get built. So you have like Tinder for X, which is a whole category on Product Hunt. But there's also Birchbox for X. And there are things like Airbnb for X. And there's Uber for X. Because people are just copying these ideas, right? Uh, Birchbox, in case you're unfamiliar, it's, uh, you know, fresh stuff arrives near your doorstep every day. It's what Joel Spolsky once famously called Netflix, but for cabbage, uh, which is a, a good way to think of it. Um, but all of these are just patterns. And if you look at why, you know, what actually triggers a pattern here, well, you get something like Uber, which as of this morning, the slide's out of date, but like uh, Uber is, say, an $18 billion business as of yesterday. As of today, it's somewhere around $40 billion. Welcome to San Francisco. Um, but what's actually happening there is someone's looking at Uber and saying, they've got 18 billion, I wouldn't mind 18 billion, how do I get 18 billion? <laughs> so so they, they ask themselves, what is, what is Uber? Well, well, a car is an expensive device, rarely used by city living folk, that delivers no value when it's not in use. Delivers no value when it's not in use. In fact, it delivers negative value because it costs you road tax and parking and all that sort of stuff that you don't want to spend. Uber replaces the need for a car with a car on demand delivered by a professional services company. So the pattern here is what will lead you to say, well, what else is expensive, rarely used, and delivers no value and out of use? And out of that whole set of things of which there are many, which of these could a professional company deliver when needed at a consistent quality? And this is the Uber for pattern, right? And out of this, you might think, well, you know, anyone got any ideas for this? Shout if you do. Insurance, that is a great one actually. Insurance delivers no value unless you need it. I don't know if the, if the business model would work for like, you know, I just crashed, insure me. <laughs> um, but uh, one example that I, I saw recently because I have a wedding to go to is uh, suits. Tuxedos specifically or any of those sort of things. They're just expensive things that sit in your wardrobe that you use maybe two or three times a year and I actually don't want to own the thing. But like, you know, surely there's not Uber for suits, is there? Oh, wrong, welcome to San Francisco. Of course there's Uber for suits. Uh, it's the black tux. You know, we made the perfect, it's Uber, but for suits. But like, there are loads of different ones here. Uh, there's like, there's of course Uber, but for lawn mowing. In fact, most recently this year at TechCrunch Disrupt, somebody launched, somebody went one degree even more meta. Uh, and they launched Uber 4. So this is a tool that lets you build your own Uber business. So they have to, <laughs> Uh, which I think is really, really cool, uh, you know, uh, so, and this is what will happen, I guess, right? So, um, I say all that to say that you manage a product in accordance with the principles that it was created under. So, like, all products are not managed equally. If you're, like, following a pattern, the way you best manage that product is you follow the pattern. Um, if you're a product-focused person who wants to build this complete product, you follow the product leader, whether it's, like, you know, in the case of Apple, it's obvious, but like in, in just like lots of businesses where like this one person has a vision of the product they want to create, and you have to follow that vision because you don't have anything else to go by. Uh, if you're customer focused, you follow the customers. If you're auteur focused, you follow the auteur. If you're itch focused, you keep scratching the itch until it's gone. And lastly, obviously, if you're pattern focused, you follow that pattern. Um, so once we know the sort of you know, the trajectory our product is on in terms of how it should be managed. We can then talk about things like scope. And to rehash probably the most uh, uh, talked about thing already today, um, scope is interesting to me for a lot of reasons. I think of a device like a scalpel. And I think a scalpel is great because it's really easy to explain what it does. And if you don't know what it does, I can rub one gently along a vein in your arm and you'll work it out pretty quickly, you know? Um, it's easy to adopt if you need a scalpel, you know exactly what it looks like. It's easy to measure, it does one thing well, and it's quick to build, quick to test. And 
The exact opposite of all those things is something like a Swiss Army knife, which is hard to market, hard to explain, does nothing particularly well, takes a long time to build. Now, uh, this is in no way a contrast uh, to previous speaker's point around, like, I totally believe early stage startups, of which we were one a few years ago, definitely designers should be Swiss Army knives early on, but products should not be. Uh, if we're gonna get into a knife fight, and I pull out this Swiss Army knife, you're gonna die laughing, you know? <laughs> if I'm hosting a classy dinner party, I'm like, here, I've got a wine opener for you. You know, it's just, it's, it's like, this device does nothing well. If you say, hey, is anyone got a toothpick and I hand you this, you like be like, okay, Dave, that's cool, we're not gonna invite you back to Warm Gun, but otherwise. Uh, so, I think it's really important that like, as in the early, like, sort of early embryonic stages of your product, you have to start off with a scalpel. You have to start off with something that clearly you can measure if it does one thing well. The, the, the crutch of the Swiss Army knife is that it's convenient in that you carry one device and get a lot of mediocrity. Uh, and like, that's okay because sometimes mediocrity is better than nothing and you're not gonna carry all of these devices. An early stage startup can't do that. And related to that is a principle called Gall's Law. Gall's Law is from systems engineering, but, but Quickly, it says that like a complex system is always found to have evolved from a simple system that works, right? You have to start off simple. In fact, a complex system designed from scratch never works. What this is basically saying is that even if you want to build a big bloated piece of shit, you have to start simple, right? You have to earn your stripes almost. Um, so to that end, like the first uh, release for, your, for any given feature or a product, it should be a solution to a real problem that exists today, not an aspirational one or not a hypothetical one or a conditional one, but an actual real problem. It should be easy to build, test, and refine, easy to explain to a business if it's B2B, or easy to solve a real world problem if it's B2C. Um, and it should be easy to adopt for customers of all sizes. Uh, don't come with a whole heap of baggage or don't come with like a, you know, a high touch sales process or any of those things. Um, and when we, we talk so much about simplicity here, uh, there's a difference between making a product simple and making a simple product. And there's a, like, that's not a typo, I actually mean what I said there. There's a difference between making a product simple and making a simple product. So making a product simple, uh, sorry, to make a, a simple product, you decide where it starts and where it stops. You choose a small workflow that you adopt. And products only ever capture one subset of a workflow. So if we take like uh, a typical user here who has to you know, she has to pay her team. And at the other side, success is when she has paid her entire company, right? You know, and this is the CEO of a company or something like that. So there's a whole series of workflows you go through. You check your bank, review the projects, build the clients, check the timesheets, verify the rates, draft the payslips, issue transfers, and then you tell the team you're paid, Wee. But the temptation here is go, right, got it, Des, I'm gonna build all that and we're done, yeah? And like, that's the, literally the wrong way to go about this. So. You wanna start at the first point in the workflow where you can add new value. And new value looks like faster, easier, cheaper, available in more places. And when you know that, you work out what the previous step is and how you can transition from that step to make it smooth so this product fits in their working day. And when you stop, you stop when you butt heads with a market leader. If the next step in the workflow is they would look up the film on Rotten Tomatoes, you do not go and build a movie review site. Let them do what they're doing. You're running, you, know, you don't have to go and recreate everything. If the next step is done in lots of different ways, back off. So an example of that would be payroll processing. There's about 196 different ways in 196 different countries to process payroll around the world. Therefore, and, and by the way, most people are already paying their staff. Or if they're not, they're probably not good customers for you anyway. Uh, so you're better off not adopting steps that require such in insane like lateral spread of functionality. Or lastly, if it's just something you can't add any value to whatsoever. So if they normally phone their customer at this point, let them phone their customer. Don't go building VOIP, it's probably not valuable. Um, so if we take a setup like this, so again, this is the workflow we described earlier. It's tempting to, just, to think of this as one product, but it's actually better when you're thinking about these things, what's small and what's a simple product. You actually think of it as like different products. And then you pick a product and you ask yourself, how can we make the first step simpler? So if the first step is always gonna be add the clients, can we import the clients from Basecamp? Can we connect their Gmail and pull in all the foreign addresses that aren't part of the domain? How can we get the clients in there as easy as possible? Similarly, when we know what the next step is, if it's sending invoices, how can we make that simpler as well? How can we tee them up for success there? I call all of this in a real sort of, you know, uh, almost comical sense, but kind of true, the Scopey Locks principle, which is your, feet, your product can't be too big because no one will adopt it. Your product can't be too small because you'll be dismissed as being a feature, not a product. You'll, be, you'll struggle to charge for it. But you will find the product size that's just right. 
And to go back to, uh, to Jared's earlier point, um, my favorite, like, so you saw the Spotify bike versus car approach. My favorite one of this is uh, by Brandon Chair from Adaptive Path, which is what he calls like, the cupcake approach, which is you start with, you know, there's two ways to bake a cake, basically. You can make a base, and you don't know if it's any good, and you can make some filling, and you don't know if that's any good, and then you can get some icing, and you put it all together, and guess what, it's your wedding day, and you taste it for the first time, you're like, shit, that's disgusting, <laughs> right? Uh, and the other way to do it would be, well, let's make a cupcake, and we're like, shit, that's disgusting, let's try and get a better cupcake, you know? Uh, you know, it's, the genius of the second approach is, when you're making this cupcake, you learn things like, the oven doesn't work. And like, that's useful data to find out early on, you know? Uh, and you can step it up. And like, what I like about that, in, con in con contrast to the Spotify example, is um, that a cupcake has a lot more self-similarity with, with a final cake than, say, a skateboard does with a car. Um, so let's talk about feature creep. So when you have a product that has had any sort of traction, the temptation is to, you know, success is a really lousy teacher in our industry. We all just think that shit, we're geniuses. Anything I do is brilliant because I have one product that got a few users. So you start to say, Let, let's go hard on features because that's what worked. Um, and there's actually a much better way to do this, which is have a default answer of no to new features, but also have a default checklist that any new feature must pass. Does it fit your vision? Can we design it so the reward is greater than the effort? Does it benefit all our customers? Will it grow the business, et cetera? I'll step through each of these, and just again to remind you, you will get the slides. So that you, if you are scribbling now, I guarantee you'll get them real quick. So one thing is, does it fit in the vision? And like your product vision, specifically if, if you're being led by a product leader, it's it's going to be the, the root of a lot of arguments. It's going to be a very sort of nuanced thing. There will be margin calls, like the easy calls are like if you're building a time tracking app and someone's like, we should build a dentistry plugin. It's easy to say no to that and think, yeah, I'm Steve Jobs. But the actual hard call is, is when you're saying no to things that actually sound like they're a good idea. And like, you know, if you're working with decent designers, most things sound like a good idea. No one comes to you, hey boss, I've got this shit idea. You know? um, so you will say no to things that, that seem like reasonable suggestions. But if you're not saying no to these things because of product vision, then you don't have a product vision. That's as simple as that. Another one is, will the feature matter in five years? So a lot of us tend to chase things that are trendy. For some reason, NPS has gone viral in, the, in like the product industry for the last while. Everyone's talking about NPS. It's the newest hot shit. I don't know if it's going to stick around for five years, so it's really hard to bank on it, right? But every now and then, different topics or ideas bubble up to being super popular. And if, it's, you know, if you're going to bank on it or add it to your product, bear in mind, it should last at least a few years so that you can at least get the money back that you put into it. Um, Jeff Bezos' way of saying this is focus on the things that don't change. And a quick example of that is like, you know, here's like five generations of technology doing the exact same job on a subway. And the, the job of being bored on a, commuting, uh, well, on a commute hasn't changed for as long as there's been commutes. And in fact, people look at this and go, oh, technology's made us all so antisocial, like as if this is a new thing. <laughs> so another question is, does it benefit all customers? So it's tempting on any given day, you might get three or four requests that roughly sounds similar, and you're like, oh my god, that's three or four people talking about it, this new feature. We need to go and build it. But you ha you know, three or four people should give you a hypothesis that you, hypothesis that you should then go and test across your user base. Not, hey, I heard this four times of our active user base of 15,000 people. Therefore, it's a must-have feature. Um, similarly, uh, act, when customers ask you for things, you have to give them like what you understand them to mean, not what they're specifically asking for. And the best way to phrase that is from Jason Fried, who said, act not on the request of your customers, but act on their behalf. So uh, my way of thinking about this is like, <laughs> you know, our customers will point us to the moon and we'll examine their fingers and then ship a minimum viable finger because we think that's what they asked for, you know, which is uh, the typical approach. Um, other questions to ask are like, does it improve, complement, or innovate on existing features? Uh, if it doesn't, then you know, how in what way is it improving the product in any way, shape, or form? A good one to think about is like, does it create new engagement with your product or does it just divide existing engagement? Uh, so you could add, say, for example, type of group uh, into your group's product and you might get people engaging with that feature, but if they're not creating extra groups or doing anything more interactive, it's useless. Uh, a good way to think about this is Diet Coke with Lime. Anyone remember Diet Coke with Lime? So basically Diet Coke with Lime is a, you know, it, it's a somewhat popular drink with people who like Lime, I guess. And, uh, it's interesting, like, if you're the PM or the product manager on Diet Coke with Lime over here, and you're like, do 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 we launched total success. And then somewhere else, in some other part of Atlanta, someone's like, 
do to do to do, what the hell happened to Diet Coke sales? Uh, and then you realize that we haven't actually created any new sales here. All we've done is forked existing sales. So you think, oh, well, that's a wash, that's net neutral, right? But it's actually not, because we've bought all this fucking lime now. You know, and like we have all these lime machines. And we, you know, we're now like juicing limes, and then we have all this extra branding we've had to do. And have we actually gotten anything out of it? No. So uh, another other good questions are, if a feature takes off, can you support it? So a, a classic thing to do is like, oh, we'll just contract an Android team to build our Android app. And you're like, okay, cool, guess what? You're gonna get feedback on your Android app and you can't act on it because you don't have an Android team. Uh, so again, it's, it's, you know, don't adopt things that you can't maintain. Um, can we design it so that reward uh, for usage is greater than the effort required? So this kind of touches on the Kano point from earlier, but like a real uh, sort of classic McKinsey consultant way to think about this is like there's things that are high reward and high effort and low reward and low effort. And your standard work will be, it takes a lot of work, but it gets a lot of return. The gimmicks and novelty and free plugins and shit like that fits in the lower left. Um, delightful features are uh, like things like filters and Instagram, wherever we're like, uh, from a user's point of view, it's very, very low effort to actually generate a filter, but they get a lot out of it. From a user's point of view, administrative tasks are the worst, because they take a lot of time and you get very little out of it. And one way to think about that is like, well, a classic one for me is Google plus circles, where like, the idea of me having to maintain all my friends and recategorize them every single time I meet somebody, so like I've met a few people at this conference already, I should log into Google Plus and recategorize my entire friendship. What's the point? Like the, it's a good idea to be able to do that, but the, the reward for it is not greater than the effort it takes. Um, obvious ones, if you can't do it well, if you're moving into an area where you have no expertise, again, uh, you know, buyer beware of sorts. Um, some classic ones you'll hear like, uh, that will lead you the wrong way. It's like, oh, well, we've talked about this feature forever. Like as if that means, therefore, it gets a pass and it has to get shipped. Or like, you know, we can produce it pretty quickly. Like I could rob a bank pretty quickly. Doesn't mean it's a good idea, right? You know, um, we've worked on it forever, right? Well, like as if your users give a, you know, care how long you've worked on a feature. I do believe Windows Vista was worked on for quite a while. You know, it didn't actually change the perception of value. Or it's months late, again, only to you, right? Um, but you make all these decisions and you say no, but that no has a perishable uh, sort of, it, that decision expires. It's not a final decision, and that's important. Um, but related to that, there are long-term and short-term implications for your decisions. Don't swap what feels good today because it gets the numbers to go up with what damages your brand forever. One way to think about that for me is LinkedIn. So I guarantee you LinkedIn have metrics that show you that all this new, if you click anywhere on the page, it adds everyone's contacts and endorses them all for WordPress. I guarantee you that, that, like, that somewhere the charts are going high and to the right. But what they do realize is LinkedIn have now created a product opportunity called, it's like LinkedIn, but for people you're actually fucking professionally connected with. You know, uh, so if you don't say no to features, you, you turn into one of these products that people have to take stuff out of just so they can use, right? I saw this remote control example and I thought, that's hilarious, ha ha ha. And then I was like, actually, I'm going to do that for my remote control because it is actually much simpler. Once you ship it, it's hard to take it back. So here's how customers value a hypothetical feature. Would you like it if we built reports? Yeah, that'd be cool. Here's the reports feature you asked for. Uh, okay, we'll take it away. <laughs> That's basically what happens. Um, so a simple way to evaluate a feature uh, when you have shipped it is who's using it and how often? And then when you have that, you can ask questions like, well, do we need to increase the frequency of it, get people using it more? or do we need to increase the adoption, get more people using it? Because shipping means nothing. Usage means everything. You ought to get more people using it, get people using it more, or you kill it. So to that end, there should be only ever four types of work in your roadmap. Improve a feature, get more people to use it, people to use it more, or a new feature to support a new workflow. So, improving a product. To improve a product, you focus on how it's used, not the category it's in, and certainly not the buyer you've designed or the, the theoretical user you have. And like, weather websites get this wrong because weather websites obsess about meteorology. And they really want to like make sure that they nail it from a point of view of like, you know, here's your precipitation forecast. But like, people actually want to know, is it gonna rain? Do I need an umbrella? What should I wear? These are real weather jobs. Can I have a barbecue tomorrow? Like, these are questions people actually come to weather apps with, and instead they get a 45% precipitation forecast, which is not actually the answer to, is it gonna rain? Um, one example, very quickly from us on Intercom about this is uh, we built this map feature and we were wondering why the hell was it so popular? All it does is just shows your users on a map. 
Then we looked at how it was used, and we're like, people use it to impress people at an, exp an expo, or they use it to impress people on Twitter, or they use it to impress investors. And if we thought this was a map, we'd build like geographical accuracy, precise filtering, clustering of segments, all these other sort of mappy type features. But when we know that people are using it just as a showpiece to show off, well, a beautiful map, an animated map, a full screen map, all these things are obvious. A worse map does a better job, right? That was the realization for us. So we made this shareable map, and all of a sudden people started sharing it. We showed people you, you can share your map, and all of a sudden, like, we had literally like thousands of tweets a day with people showing off this thing because we, know, we knew how to improve it because we knew how it was used. So last piece there is don't confuse the category you're in with the value you deliver because customers only care about the latter. Related to that, before you design, before you release, you design for the behavior that you expect. Once it's out there, you have to design for the behavior that you get. Peter Drucker is much smarter than uh, I am for sure, and he said this many, many, many years ago when he said, the customer rarely buys what the company thinks it's selling them. So I have one more section, but I'm hopelessly out of time, so I'll, I'll probably just, uh, what I'll do is just skip uh, through to the very last slide so that you can, guys can get this, and that, that was my fault. I was under the impression I had a longer time. But uh, I've been Des Trainer. If you want the slides, just drop an email to the bottom line there. Blog, as Jared said, is blog.intercom.io. I've been Des Trainer. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, uh, we're going to get Leah set up here, but while we have that, we have a, some moments for uh, uh, Des to uh, uh, answer some questions. One of the things I want to uh, tell you, we are uh, videotaping the sessions today, and the slides will be available. That was like the most popular question during break. And it was even more popular than where the men's room was. So. Uh, 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 the, the, uh, the slides will be up very shortly. In a few weeks, we'll have the, the videos from many of the presentations available. Uh, so because we're doing the videotaping, you need to raise your hand, and we'll bring a microphone to you, and you can ask Des a question. So what questions do we have for Des here? Uh, oh, oh, way over there, of course. It's always the person farthest away, I've learned. <laughs> no, that's OK. I'll come to you. Here you go. 17. are doing a lot is listen to the customers and we roll out features as quickly as we can based on demand mm -hmm. and like you said a few times we've had situations when we rolled something out and then we thought you know it's not working we'll take it back and it was like wow, a problem yeah but uh, the thing is I'm having trouble figuring out well what's my vision because my customer is my vision right they're mm -hmm. basically asking for it and I'm putting it together yeah. but um, it's tough to actually mark that. You know, like what you said, four people are asking for something and I'm designing for 15,000. Mm -hmm. Do you know of quick and easy ways to test? I mean, apart from actually saying, writing an email to all my customers saying, oh, would you like me to build this feature? So that's my question. Yeah, great. <laughs> so uh, there's a few things to say. One is like, um, your vision is gonna be that you're a customer focused entrepreneur effectively. So you're, you're gonna, just, it's a, some part of you will always build whatever the majority of your customer base wants and that's totally fine. There are like hundreds and hundreds of billion dollar companies doing exactly that. So don't worry in that regard. And uh, what I would say is it sounds like you could improve your rollout process. So rather than giving a new feature to all of your customers, you should probably roll it out iteratively like to 100, then 1,000, then 2,000 and make sure that you're seeing high uptake, high usage, high frequency, high adoption uh, because the danger, like the, the flip side of the whole, hey, we, we launch it now and use it, is that you've given it to everyone. And that's, that can be quite like, uh, limiting because now you've got like 15,000 people on your back saying, where did that thing go? Uh, if you only release it to 500 and you get the feedback and make sure that you get good adoption. Like when you're at the sort of scale of 15,000 people, a small portion of your user base has a lot of self similarity with your entire user base. So as long as you take a good random sample across all price plans, across all that, you'll get the same behavior. So if you can't make it a success with 500 people, it's not going to be a success with 15,000, and that's the time to kill it. Uh, so that, that's kind of uh, the short answer there is the manner in which you roll it out is how you preserve uh, adoption of your product. So you don't end up with this like sort of, you know, I guess like miles wide and inches deep type product. Uh, the other thing you should look at is probably like how to, how to have a, a good like modularity architecture, how, like, how to have it set up basically. People are only ever encumbered with the features they use and love. Uh, and if you ship a Salesforce plugin or a new Salesforce, I should literally never see it. 
And like that presents new challenges in terms of how you design because like you have all these conditional behaviors and stuff about whether or not something's there or not. But it's the best way to address an issue like that where you want to actually give a lot of people a lot of functionality, but no, you're in all 15,000 don't want the exact same stuff. So modularity is your only option there. Does that make sense? Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, Des Trainer. Thanks.